Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Sales Hacker webinar. Um, I'm super excited to have this conversation today. I think it's super important. Um, and, you know, we've got the right people here to join us and give us their expertise, knowledge, and insights on their experiences and what they um, are doing to help with this potential issue that you have in your, in your organization. So um, everybody, thank you all so much for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking the time to, to hop on with us um, and, uh, and rock with us throughout the next uh, 45 to an hour. Um, I know it's a lot of, a lot of time, so um, thank you for joining us. Um, really appreciate it. So what we're speaking about today, okay? I will uh, reintroduce the topic shortly, but um, we are going on the topic of how to solve the missing data problem that's wrecking your forecast, right? Um, a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that go into, um, you know, accurate forecasting, right? And there are, you know, some orgs out there that might have problems with inaccuracy and, you know, putting together those forecasts and then at end of quarter getting a bunch of surprises like, oh my God, we're way off or so on and so forth. So um, we're going to kind of speak about how to mitigate those, those issues um, and make sure that you are on point and all your forecasts are exactly what you expect. Okay. So, um, really excited to dive into this. I think it's really important to kind of for organizations to grow and, and get better. So um, it's gonna be great. And you're not gonna regret being here. Okay. So first off, we got a couple of housekeeping things I do want to get through before we introduce our panel and we start the conversation here. But um, so first off, again, thank you all so much. We do all of these events for the community and for you guys. So um, we really appreciate you showing up with us today. Um, you know, I, like again, I said, 45 to an hour is a lot of, a uh, lot, lot of your day. So, um, thank you. We really appreciate it. Um, second of all, we love a lively chat. Okay. So let us know who you are, who's rocking with us, where you're calling in from in the chat, maybe something about yourself, your favorite sandwich, whatever it is. Um, so we can get a bit more acquainted with you guys who's with us. Um, you know, we want to hear your ideas, your thoughts, your opinions on what we're speaking about today. Um, because that's what makes these best the best events, the most engaging and participative ones. So um, yeah, hop in the chat, you know, get that going. Let us know who you are. Um, Michael from Syracuse, thanks for joining us. Another Michael from um, Hopedale. Thank you guys. My name is Michael too. So, you know, we got lots of Michaels in uh, around here. Um, great. Well, thank you guys. Really appreciate it. Um, okay. A few more things. Second, this is being recorded. So no worries. If you guys have to jump off, go deal with the meeting, pick up a kid, put out a fire, whatever it is that you got to do to take you away from the screen. No need to worry. We'll have the recording of this event in your inbox within 24 hours. So if you need to share with your peers, colleagues, leadership, whatever it is you need to revisit, no worries. You'll have that um, um, in your inbox. Cool. Um, another one, again, like I mentioned, the chat, love it. We see people coming in here. This is fantastic. Thank you all for, for hopping on and, 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 uh, and you know, letting us know where you're calling in from. Um, but again, you know, we want to hear your ideas, your opinions, your thoughts, keep that in the chat. If you have any questions, okay, that you want to ask the three of these panelists, please drop it in the Q and A. Okay. The Q the reason for that is because I'll be monitoring the Q and A much more closely. So if anything comes in there, I can loop the questions in real time and answer them as they, as they come in. Um, and you know, as we get the banter going in the chat, if you ask a question there, we might miss it. We don't want to miss it. We want to answer all the questions that you guys have. So um, if you have any, drop it in the Q&A and we will address it as soon as they come through, okay? Um, fantastic, we're moving along here quickly, okay? Um, one more thing before we dive into the juice and uh, get going here. So. Um, if you haven't already, I'm pretty sure all the panelists have, but at the bottom of your screen, you'll see that there's a little blue bubble. Um, change that from whatever it says in your screen to everybody or host and panelists. The reason for that is because now everybody on the screen here and the panelists and myself will have visibility to the Q&A as well as the, um, the chat. So if there is anything that I oversee or I miss that we want to address, um, they might be able to catch it, but I don't think I will, just, uh, just in case. Um, Okay, sweet. That's all the boring stuff out of the way, guys. Um, I appreciate you bearing with me over the housekeeping stuff, but let's dive into the conversation. Okay, just hold, bear with me. Let me just share my screen here. No momento, guys.
Does that look all good to everybody? Can are, are we good, panelists? Can you see that there? Perfect. Okay. So, like I mentioned at the beginning of this call, what we're speaking about today is how to solve the missing data problem that's wrecking your forecasts, okay? Now, a quick agenda for what we're gonna run through today. Um, we'll do, I'm gonna get some great, some introductions from the three of our panelists so we can get a bit more acquainted with who's gonna be blessing us with their expertise and knowledge today. Um, secondly, I've got a couple uh, poll questions that I wanna just ask the, 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 the audience so we can um, you know, just see who's, who's rocking with us, what's going on and, and so on. So um, just bear with us for that. And then from there, we'll dive into the juice of what we're all here today. Um, we do have a Q and A piece at the end. However, you know we 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 do like to address them as in real time as they come in, just because they'll be top of mind, um, and we can articulate the answers a bit better. So um, I'll loop the those questions as they come in um, as fits. So please, again, guys, this is your chance to ask these three your burning questions on this topic. Um, you know, this is a workshop, so you know, please, we want as many questions as you guys have. Right, the more questions. The more participative, the better the event, okay? We have great, a lot of content to get through. However, um, please let us know if you have any burning questions because this is your chance to, to ask, okay? Um, awesome. So that's our agenda. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our fantastic panelists. So I'll start off with Alex. Alex Greer, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, very appreciate you taking the time to bless us with your knowledge and insights on this topic. But um, please, if you don't mind, just giving us a bit of background on yourself, um, how you came to where you are, what you're all about, so we can just get a bit more acquainted with you. Sure, so um, I'm the uh, Senior Director of Sales Operations and Sales Development here at Set Sail. I've been here for uh, my year anniversary is coming up next week. Uh, started my tech career at Cloudera as an SDR and then handled global inside sales enablement there. Uh, spent time at Medallia, uh, also doing inside sales enablement and strategy, and then uh, started a, a startup called Signal HQ, building a, a sales tool around intent data. We were acquired by Bombora, spent some time there before joining SetSail. So that's uh, my career in a nutshell. Really excited to, to be discussing this topic together with uh, Rachel and Aaron. So thanks for hosting us. Sweet. That's awesome. I'm really excited to hear your experiences in this realm, as I'm sure you've got uh, a lot of insight. So um, Alex, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Um, I'll throw it over to Rachel. Rachel, thank you so much for spending some time with us today and giving us your your uh, your, your valuable um, time as well. So thank you so much. Uh, please just give us a bit, of, bit more background on yourself, um, what you're all about, so we can get a bit more acquainted. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I am so excited to like be here with Alex and Aaron, like two people that I completely respect. And I'm so excited to hear like everything y'all have to say about these topics. Um, I've sat in nearly every sales seat within a sales organization from AE to sales manager to VP of sales. But the majority of my career was spent um, in sales enablement for um, Xerox and Konica Minolta. And uh, one day about four years ago, I read a book called Gap Selling and um, it changed everything for me. And so much so that I reached out on LinkedIn to Keenan, the author and said, you know, how can I join this circus? And, um, and next thing I knew I was his head of sales and uh, got to learn how to gap sell from um, the, the master of gap selling himself, which was quite a wild ride for a couple of years. And um, now I have the privilege of um, raising up an army of gap selling uh, certified sales trainers um, to bring our, um, our message to the sales world and lift everybody up. So um, I'm so excited. This is my favorite topic in the world. So happy to be here. Beautiful. We're very happy to have you. Um, and amazing. That's your favorite topic to talk about. So then we, everybody, get your questions going because we got a pro here. So uh, let's, uh, <laughs> let's uh, make it happen here. Okay. Well, thank you again, Rachel, so much for joining us. We really, really appreciate you giving us the time. Um, last but not least, Aaron, thank you so much for joining us as well. 
um, and giving us your time. Um, we really appreciate you, uh, you hopping on, but please just give us a bit more background on yourself, what you're all about so we can get to know you a bit better. Thanks, Mikey. Yeah, thanks for having me. Really honored to be sitting here next to Rachel and Alex. Excited to learn with everybody else here from these two experts. Um, my life and, and career journey has been an interesting one. I've covered a number of different industries. A lot of that time was spent literally knocking on doors, uh, trying to sell either telecommunications. And back in my day, it was like DSL and landlines. I sold home security. Uh, <laughs> I got into real estate for a long time. I had a lot of success. And then I tried to open my own development company and I spent all my money on land that I couldn't sell fast enough. So I was like, where can I make money? So I got into technology. Uh, and ever since then, it's been a fantastic ride. I worked for a, a Salesforce consulting company that also did like fractional SDR work uh, based in Austin, Texas, lived there for a little while. Then I went and worked for Huddle uh, to lead a, their elite a sales team, uh, which focused on like uh, D1 colleges and pro teams. And quickly I got put into revenue operations and enablement, which I didn't know what they were because I never had any of those assets when I was growing up in my sales career, but I learned and fell in love with it really quickly um, and uh, was able to use a ton of what I'd learned about opportunity management, sales training, best practices throughout my life to build content and build machines and systems that made it much easier for the people that I serve to be effective. And now every day, that's what I do at Winning by Design. I'm a consultant and a trainer. Uh, so we focus primarily on working with companies that got a recent funding round at a merger and acquisition, or just really are having a hard time. They come to us, ask for help. We give them consulting recommendations. And oftentimes it results in us doing training for them too. I also lead what's called the revenue architecture course for people who just want to understand recurring revenue in new ways. So I teach that on a monthly basis and uh, that's where I spend most of my time, but I'm happy to be here, excited to talk about this and excited to learn with everybody. Awesome. Well, Aaron, we're happy to have you here. And, you know, like you mentioned, you've kind of, you got all the experience, right? So I'm excited to, to hear what you got. Um, and I think, you know, you're right. You know, I think that a lot of people maybe on this call might still not have those assets or resources to kind of really make sure everything's moving forward. So um, I think this is why it's such a good conversation to have, right? Um, awesome. Okay. So that's introductions. Again, thank you three for joining us. But um, I just want to run a couple questions for the chat as well as a, a quick poll and then we'll we'll dive into into the juice here. Um, so everybody, who's on the line right now? Okay, let us know your, your your title, you know, where you're calling in from. Are you an SDR? Are you an AE? Are you a manager? Are you in sales ops? Um, success? What is it? We want to know who's, uh, who's, who's hanging with us, where you're kind of sitting so we can um, at least guide some of our, our, our answers in the right direction there. So um, great. So Michael, Andy, both uh, sales, sales managers. Um, Ed Elaine, hopefully I, I, I said that right. She's in sales enablement manager, head of sales, SDRs. All right. There we go. Thank you, everybody, for, for dropping in, the, in, in that info for us. So um, keep it coming. We want to we wanna see where everyone's sitting. Um, in the org, just so we can get a better understanding. But it does seem we've got a lot of leaders here and a lot of um, people in the in in those uh, in those positions that might be actually conducting these uh, potential forecasts. So um, thank you all so much for 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 joining us and giving us some insight on who is with us. Okay, great, Ronnie, Dean, Candice, awesome. Well, thank you all. Okay, cool. So we got a good idea of what's uh, what who's who's with us in the line here. So um, fantastic. Leslie, Strategic Enterprise AE, um, fantastic. Okay, cool. Now, let me just run a quick poll here. So what in your guys' mind, hold up, sorry. There we go. I'm gonna launch a quick poll. So what information indicates a deal is likely to close in your guys' mind? Okay, let me know. I'm just gonna launch this quickly. Everybody can see that. There's the poll. I'll give that a little bit of time here. Sorry. Okay. Critical event, size of the problem, a critical event, seniority of the contacts, number of people are involved in the process. Okay. That votes for everything. But it looks like, uh, you know, the size of the problem, critical event is, is taking it here. Okay, I'll give it a couple more seconds just to get a few more answers. Okay. 
Okay, and I will stop it there. Share these results for you guys. So we can see here that you know uh, the the runner is a, a critical event, and then we got the size of the problem, seniority of contacts, and then the number of people that are involved in the process. Um, you know, that's kind of what we thought. Do you do any anybody on the line or any of the panelists? Do you guys have any thoughts on 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 those responses? Yeah, I agree with uh, with everybody. I think all these are really important factors, um, but I would say, in my experience, you know, priority is key. And that's going to come down to the magnitude of what's going on and how urgent it is. Uh, yeah. So I think uh, what was said here makes a ton of sense. Yeah, agreed. I mean, Rachel, uh, gap selling was a game changer for me too. And you can have all sorts of people interested and in all of the senior level people, but if they don't feel like it's an important enough problem to solve, then it's unlikely that there's going to be a, a deal closing anytime soon. So mm -hmm. Uh, all important factors, but it starts with highlighting how big the gap gap is and, and positioning yourself accordingly. Yeah, totally. Cool. Okay, sweet. So we got some uh, we got some some insights here, but let's um let's dive into it. Okay, the exciting stuff. Um, okay, I'm just gonna stop sharing here, guys. Give me uno momento. Okay, so I'm gonna start off with a, with a you know a brief kind of talking point here and. You know, Rachel, I'll start off with you just to kind of get your thoughts. Um, so what do you think, you know, why are missing contacts wrecking your ability to grow accounts? Um, how do you think, you know, by not having the proper contacts within your CRM and so on is really affecting, you know, expansion and growing those accounts to, to, to bring in more revenue? Um, Rachel, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, some of it is the obvious things, right? Like, I mean the average tenure of most positions is somewhere between 12 and 24 months. So if you only have one contact and that contact leaves the organization, then um, you, you have to start over from scratch over and over. Yeah. Um, and then the other piece is um, and when you're prospecting specifically, each contact is going to, you know, they have different key performance indicators that are important to them. And so these problems are going to manifest themselves in a different way for each of them. And so you've got to be able to adjust your messaging. Um, whereas, you know, I used to teach everybody like go straight up to the top to the highest C level. And I still believe that you should always start at the, the C level, um, but you can't ignore like the end user and the folks in the middle either, um, because they're the ones who are feeling the most pain. And they're the ones most likely to connect the root cause to the business problem, where that like the higher you go, the more they just see the business problem and they're unaware of the root cause. So um, having all of those contacts gives you an opportunity to um, personalize your prospecting messaging to the appropriate person and get in in a multitude of different ways, right? I mean, it's quite simple. If I have one person, I got one shot. And if I got three people, I got three shots, right? So it's just about odds. Then when you get into um, the sales cycle, of course, um, I think, you know, we speak a lot about um, getting the whole buying team involved in the process. But then a lot of times the ancillary people outside of like our main one or two contacts don't actually get into the CRM, right? They show up on the Zoom meetings, they're back and forth in the contacts, but nobody actually takes the time to put them in the CRM. Well, guess what? When your contact goes dark on you and is ghosting you, guess whose contact information you now do not have to be like, yo, Aaron, like I haven't heard from Alex based on our last meeting. X, Y, Z was going to happen to you as the sales manager. Like, can you help me out to get this thing moving along? Right. So it's like, you're not utilizing all of those resources that you created in the buying process. You're not putting that information into the CRM. I, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. That's one best practice that I've actually incorporated. The minute I have any communication with somebody else in a deal, it direct, goes directly into the CRM. Just because like, you know, I know once you're going back and forth, you can lose kind of contact and stuff like that. Like, just like you said. So um, I love that point there. Um, Alex, to, have, to expand yeah. on that, Rachel, too, one of the things we've been noticing talking with customers is this problem compounds when accounts change hands. 
So you've missed that contact. Accounts change hands, you know, for one reason or another from, from one rep to another. And there's a lot of trouble with this siloed knowledge that gets lost. And the rep that inherits the account is now starting from scratch. They don't know who we've engaged with in the past. Um, and so like Mikey, you might be one of those ultra diligent reps that is really, really good about keeping the CRM up to date. I would bet that even so, you don't maybe 100% of the time, maybe you're 99% diligent about adding those contacts. Sure. Um, the challenge uh, organizationally for sales leaders that are on the line, the enablement leaders, the VPs of sales, the ops leaders is at scale across all of your reps, how frequently is this happening? And as accounts change hands and you're still working on these opportunities or as the closed one business of a new customer changes hands to the account manager and the customer success rep, how often are we having to start from scratch because we don't really have the full picture of who all we've engaged with? Mm. Yeah. Love that. I think both of your comments are super valid. You've got Rachel talking about the, you know, the multiples and the scale and the unit economics is really important. The more people you have access to, the higher the probability of success. Um, you know, Alex talked a little bit about, you know, the fact that you don't know when those things are going to change, right? Whether it's internal or external, we've got moving parts and variables. And I think the data backs this stuff up. It's really interestingly, um, you know, we have a real fortune as uh, consultants to be able to look at a lot of customers' data. And we were able to put together a couple sample sets of some pretty robust data sets to determine what truth there is here and what we're perceiving and feeling qualitatively about the number of people we have and, and the likelihood of success. And um, on slide seven, which we're going to pull up here in a second, it talks about the number of accounts that are actually listed or number of contacts listed on an account and how it changes or impacts the probability of having a response. Uh, just like Rachel alluded to, you know, if you got one person, you got one shot, but if you have more than that, it does increase your probabilities of communication. I don't, Mikey, is that something we can pull up really quick? That slide that says account response rate, uh, just it. so we can look at that. There you go. Yeah, so what y'all can see here, this is actually from an extract that I did, uh, shout out to Arnie Gulaf Singh, who was not on the call, but he and I worked together on this project. And what we found was that there's about a 10% chance of getting a response when you just had one account or one contact on the account. But for this particular set of clients, we saw that almost triple as you had three to five people in those accounts that were listed as contacts. And then it doubled again when you went to six plus. So we saw a huge increase in the likelihood of getting communication back from those customers, the more contacts we actually had in those accounts. And this isn't just about getting a response to our initial outreach. The same story is told when you talk about converting those accounts into actual opportunities. The next slide that we have just really quickly shows a very similar story about accounts opportunity conversion rates. So this isn't about wins, this is those that actually go from being not qualified ops to becoming qualified ops. And you see that going from that one contact even to three to five as a 50% increase in the probability of becoming an opportunity. And then we also see that take place again, going from three to five to six plus. So there's a very clear data backed up truth that the more contacts we have on these accounts, there is a much higher probability of it progressing those customers, which if we're not progressing a dealer conversation, we're definitely not going to turn into money. Uh, so this is a very clear indication of what y'all are saying is true. Do you, Fair enough. As, as you all work with your clients, have you set these up as KPIs that you advise them to track? Absolutely. We, we typically do it both through a qualitative and a quantitative approach. So we're going to say, hey, there are certain benchmarks of contacts you're going to look for. We indicate what's best practice versus what's ideal. And then we obviously want to talk about the qualitative stuff too, which is, okay, if we have multiple contacts, what do we do with them? And I think Rachel was really great in saying, hey, you're going to message an end user or an initiator in the buying process very differently than you would somebody who's a strategic decision maker or a strategic leader in the business because their priorities are different, but you've got to have a balanced approach to both. So absolutely, we're going to look at, hey, not only how many do we need to establish that benchmark, but what kinds of roles do we want? And if we have them, what are we going to say to them? And you know, why is multi-threading so valuable? And this does back up that data for us. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's uh, just like kind of a, a thought um, having more people on a potential opportunity because there's more visibility on the other end is a, a, like an indicator for why you get more kind of response rates or what, what, what do you think on that? 
I mean, what we found was that, you know, this was all done within a pretty tight window of time. So even to address, you know, Joseph's question too, th these are when we're using multiple sequences or cadences across various parties within a, a similar period. So we found that, of course, the, the more that you have and the more diverse that population is, the more success you have. And, um, you know, we can we can think about that. I've got impressions as to why it would work, but the data is very clear. If you are approaching many uh, roles and many people, something's going to resonate and it's going to turn into an internal conversation, too. Cool. Just make sure you don't send them all the same message. Right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> or you're going to be annoying and they're going to hate you. Oh, you know, yeah. I think. Uh, a lot of times when we talk about these things, I know there's a lot of enablement folks on the line. And we so we talk a lot about the what. And I feel like, yeah, we have fancy charts and, and all these things. But I think like instinctually, this just makes sense, right? Like, <laughs> is it like rocket science? The challenge from an enablement standpoint is like, how do we get our sales team to buy in to putting this information into the machine? Right. And I think where we go wrong is we do this. We have this type of like conversation and um, and then we start, you know, require like requiring people to put this many contacts in. And like we don't give enough of like the why and the what's in it for them and helping them understand that, like getting them excited about the fact that, hey, like if your customer gets, goes dark on you, like, which is the most annoying thing, right? And it, it's the number one reason we lose is to status quo. And we think it's great. And we have all the data, we have all our budget timing, all that shit in there. And then the person just like disappears. Well, guess what? Like if you have all of that information in the CRM and all of the different contacts, then you know you can be really strategic about bringing that conversation back into the light and that's going to happen to you significantly less i think the other thing is like salespeople, we trust our memory like way too much we think that we are going to remember things that we are never going to remember and so they think they're holding a lot of this information in their head a lot of them have notepads sitting next to them and they have like pages and pages of notes that later don't make any sense Right. And so, um, you know, I think addressing the why they're not putting the information in and being really strategic as leaders in inspiring them and getting them excited about using these tools, the data tools to help them sell more, as opposed to, you know, um, because they think that you want them to put it in so that you have the contact so that when they are fired, you, you can still get in the account. That's why they think that we want the information in there. And too often it's not communicated to them the value of, hey, if you don't close this nine months from now, when you don't even remember this person, you can go in and like have all the notes on like, five different people within the organization and whoever's still there, like you can reach out to them. The other thing I would offer is if you have five people on a meeting, you should automatically follow up with all five people. Mm -hmm. So too often we follow up with one of the, the people and maybe we, maybe we CC everybody else on that email. I don't do that. Like I follow up individually speaking to something that person said was important to them and like how the problem is manifesting to that person individually. Because what also happens is the reps, they get scared to communicate with someone other than the decision maker when things aren't moving along because they feel like, oh, they're going to get mad at me or they're going to think I'm jumping over their, their heads, right? I'm going to ruin the deal if I go around them. But if you open up that conversation right from the beginning, then it's not weird when like a month later, you're like, hey, Sally, remember we met and like blah, 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 and Bob's not responding, right? So you can, you can kind of set up this precedent that you're going to communicate with everyone right out the gate. And if they communicate with everyone, well, guess what happens? If you have a, a, a sales tool, right, then it all is going to create a contact for that person attached to that opportunity and nobody has to just put it in, right, because your emails are attached. So just like teach them how to use it in a way that works for them and you'll get the data that you need. Yeah, no, I, I love that point too, right? And you said it perfectly where, you know, if you have multiple people on the line that are 
having the conversation, they all have different priorities to potentially working with you and different needs and different kind of um, outcomes that they want, right? And then even if they aren't the champion, they have a ton of influence on the champion's decision, right? So it's, you know, like, I love how you said that where following up directly with each individual separately and focusing on their specific pain is, you know, best practice and will help you move the deal a lot quicker. Um, cool. Yeah. So I, well, I would love to hear, you know, I, and I don't know got Rachel, but um, Aaron, I know you just answered in, in the Q&A, but um, Alex, how have you been able to enforce, you know, or encourage your teams to kind of make sure that they're updating the CRM religiously? Well, um, truthfully, that was one of the things that really drew me to set sail is, you know, it, it can really feel like pulling teeth working with the reps, no matter how much in an enablement capacity you, you try to highlight all of the value it is to, to enter this information. There are some things that now technology wise, such as set sale, that can deburden the rep from having to take that time and will automatically do it on their behalf. Mm -hmm. So that's been really transformational as we've used set sale here internally and as we work with customers is any contact that we're engaged with and reaching out to that automatically gets populated. Even the, for the folks that aren't using a sales engagement tool, it's still automatically populating to the right account, the right open opportunity and the CRM, as well as all of their meetings and, and interactions. Um, and so this is, this is a great KPI, Aaron, that, that I'd love to help build internally here in order for us to accurately reflect those numbers you know those contacts need to be populating and luckily for us with with our technology it's it's happening in the absence of that we would have to go around to the reps and that that becomes a combination of enablement you know highlighting why it's valuable and teaching it as a best practice but ultimately you know you need the individual sales managers overseeing the reps to help reinforce that behavior and make sure that it's happening um, so to the extent that it can be automated, it's really, really uh, a huge relief and a lifesaver and allows it to happen much more scalably. Uh, otherwise, you've, you've got a little bit of work cut out for you to encourage that manual entry. Yeah, totally. Awesome. Okay, let's move on. Love this. This is fantastic, guys. Okay, so next kind of point we want to touch on here. Um, and Aaron, I'll start with you to kind of kick us off. But... Um, you know, how have you been able to measure the opportunity or sorry, you know, opportunity, progress, maturity, and, you know, how can you improve that? So um, would love to hear what your thoughts are um, on that. Yeah, I think one of the best ways to determine how close you are to an opportunity actually closing is all around the sense of urgency. We talked in the beginning about how important priority is in anybody who's used the past and Eisenhower matrix to think about how they spend their time or what they should be doing, understands that the balance of importance and urgency is typically what's indicative of what we should be doing with our time. And so when people decide anything, they're thinking not only about the magnitude of how big of a problem it is, but how pressing is it to do something about it today? Um, and oftentimes, if we're not measuring that level of urgency, we're going to see some things happen to our opportunities that are very common and yet very frustrating, whether it's a, as a salesperson or as a leader. I mean, I think many of you have probably shown up into a pipeline review or a one-on-one -on -one and all of a sudden the close date's totally different than what it was before the meeting. It's like, oh yeah, I got pushed out a couple of weeks or you show up at a pipeline report and you see every, every deal is closing the 30th of the month or the 31st of the month. We've all been there. We've all seen those close dates show up that way. And typically that happens because we don't actually understand that critical event that's driving the customer to do something. They may have indicated a timeline to us in our initial discovery, but we haven't confirmed the consequences of inaction, nor have we gotten them to admit that it's not something they're willing to tolerate. So if you want to pull up just slide 11 really quick, Mike, I think this is kind of an interesting story. Uh, 11, if you could, the next one down, actually. Um, you just kind of look at this table and if we're doing a good job of identifying timeline or if you have like BANT as a framework that you use to qualify opportunities where you're thinking about budget authority, needs and timeline, you may have an idea of when they want to get something done. Oh, it's got to be done in Q1. It needs to be done this month. Oh, if it's not done this week, we've got a big problem. Great. Okay. But what is the problem? We got to ask those questions and identify, okay, what does that actually mean? 
mean if it's not done? What's the consequence of not having this done? If they can articulate that to us, it's differentiating it from a generic timeline, just an idea of a target date, to an actual timeline associated with a consequence. But even in those situations, it's not near enough. We have to know that they're unwilling to tolerate that consequence. It has to be unacceptable. That is what makes these events critical. And when you have closed dates that are tied to like a work back schedule, like if it's done at this point that enables this, which enables us to have a solution in place to prevent this disaster from occurring that we all agree can't happen, that closed date is way more likely to be on target. In fact, the studies we've done have shown that it's 80% more likely to close within that target date if there's a critical event attached than not. And so we, we like to lean into this. And if you visualize this concept of, of what it means, you can kind of look pretty quickly at slide 10, the one you just had up on the board, sorry about that. And we've all been there too, where we've talked to those customers, like what Rachel was talking about. We've sent our proposals off and then we don't hear anything. They go dark for a long time. And all they were really doing was learning about what was out there. And we follow up, we don't hear anything. Well, then they experience something really bad. And now that they're fully educated buyers, they don't have that tolerance anymore. They now know better. And because they went through that, they're more willing to come back and say, hey, can I get a quote from you? Even though you already sent them one two months ago, you're like, what is happening? And of course that deal closes in like two days. And you're like, oh man, that was like the fastest sales cycle ever. When in reality, it's the same sales process. They just weren't ready yet to say they weren't willing to tolerate the consequence. So this is just a visualization of what we see critical events doing to help ensure that process moves more, more effectively. Alex, did you have a comment? I was going to ask um, both of you, Rachel and Aaron, the consequences is such a huge piece. Are there certain phrases or statements that uh, you're keeping your eyes and ears open for or seeking to uncover that are indicative of those consequences? What types of things are you looking for the customer to say that that is indicative of that? Yeah, Rachel, I don't want to monopolize it. Do you have anything you want to share first? No, go ahead. Cool. So you'll see that impact is highlighted here. Um, I like to think about impact really in two ways. There's the idea of emotional impact, the way that people feel about things that are happening, whether they're good or bad, and how it affects their emotions, their day-to-day -day processes. And then there's also rational impacts, things that we can quantify, things that are measurable, typically things that impact the business because they're at scale and things that we can measure. And so oftentimes when we're thinking about how do I pick out that impact? You want to listen to feeling language. If you're talking to someone, are they saying things like annoyed, frustrated? It's difficult. It's taxing. It's just not easy. It sucks. It's crappy. You know, <laughs> there's all these kinds of words they're going to say that tells you how they feel about what's going on, which means that there's something that resonates to them on an emotional level, which is great. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes that's not enough to get the business to decide. So if there's that plus, they say, well, we have an initiative in place that needs, needs to get done, or we're trying to measure this particular metric, and they attach something that they're trying to evaluate that is business-centric. If we can find both of those things, we can typically latch onto that and ask, okay, well, you said that this is an important metric to you. What happens if by this particular time that you targeted, that's not done? What does that mean to your business? And they'll start to tell us the consequences. But we have to ask once we pick up on those little questions or comments that they say. So what I would offer here is um, when we think about where an account is in the pipeline, um, you know, we have three questions. Does the customer have a problem that we solve? Do they admit they have a problem? And the last one is, are they willing to go on the journey to fix it? And I think us as salespeople, um, we oftentimes have people come to us and tell, we ask them their problems. And we, um, we try to suss out if they have some sort of timeline to fix it. So the first thing I wanna look at is if I'm a sales leader and I have to forecast, I'm going straight to the CRM and what I'm looking for, if somebody tells me this deal is closing, I am looking for the business problem. So when we talk about problems, we need to separate those two things out because reps think that they are putting it, data in that reflects the problem. But what they're doing is they're reflecting the technical process problem that they have. 
the missing tool or the broken prompt process. But that is not why the customer buys. So if I'm going in and someone's projecting a deal is going to close and I don't see in the CRM the business problem that this broken tool or broken process is causing, then I can tell you that that deal is not closing. It's not closing because um, if the rep doesn't know the business problem that this broken tool or process is causing for them, I guarantee you the client does not know that this broken tool or process is causing this business problem and this business impact. Mm -hmm. So from a forecasting standpoint, like that's what I'm looking for. Is the business problem in there? Is it quantified? It, can I see the impact? Um, as Aaron said, what is the cost? Like how big is the pain, uh, pain of change? And not just financially, but emotionally and from a workflow standpoint, right? How large is the pain of change in relation to the um, pain of staying the same. And that's our job as salespeople is to help the client understand that piece before we ever start talking about our products or solutions. So if you're going into the CRM and you don't see root cause, problem, business impact laid out within that within the discovery notes, then you, and someone's projecting it's going to close, then they, you know, why, why do they think it's going to close? What is that based on? And if you're using things like Bant and stuff like that, it's usually based on like crap. It's based on the customer told me there's this timeline. The customer told me there's this budget. So like a seller creates budget. A seller creates timeline. A seller creates the critical event. If they knew all these things, then everyone would buy things online and they would never need you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think thinking about this, you have to understand that before you're going to get the right data, you're going to have to change the behavior of your sellers. Otherwise, the data that's in there is just going to be garbage. I love that. That was I really liked how you how you put that. And I think it's like, um, you know, you're so right. I think there's like underplaying in the discovery process, right? It's like a lot of reps just kind of do the discovery call and then, okay, this sounds good, hand it off, right? Whereas like the deeper you dive, the more information you uncover, the better chances, like you said, of it actually closing. Just I feel like there's a lot of reps out there that are honestly sometimes like scared to ask those questions and dive deeper into the conversation with that potential client. But in the long run, it's going to pay off if you get the, the right information out, right? Um, cool. We have a question from Axel in the in the in the in the chat here. I want to quickly just um, ask the three of you. So he asked, would a MEP or mutual engagement plan help clarify the timeline, buying cycle, and correct impact on the deal? Um, he says, I believe it would also help us understand if we are actually aligned with those who have the ability to sign off on the deal. What are your thoughts? And I'll start with you, Alex, on that one. Ooh, can I punt? Because I, I don't have a ton of experience using like a mutual engagement plan tool and would love to hear what the others have to say. Sure. Aaron, Rachel, do you have any thoughts on that one? Rachel, all yours. I'm happy to take it afterwards, though. Go ahead. Um, so I would... I would say that um, if you're in a larger type of enterprise sale, then um, a, a mutual engagement plan of some sort might make sense. Um, what I will offer is that when I see the sun, it's done very poorly. So if it's for the benefit of the customer so that they know what's coming next and so that they understand what the process looks like and it's based on them specifically and what you uncovered in discovery, then I could see where that would be valuable. But in most cases, I'm going to say that this is kind of sales Sandlery old school stuff that um, is unnecessary. It maybe adds a little friction into the sales process. What I would offer instead is that all of your follow up and all of your um, like your proposal, like my proposals, they lay out like 
when I look at people, our clients' proposals, it's like five pages of shit about them and their product that like the client is just turning to the, going to the last page to see the price. Um, and understanding that, you know, that proposal is like, likely going to be handed off to somebody who was not in your meetings and who was not in all of these discussions. So what I would offer instead of mutual engagement plans, like I said, unless you're like in some crazy enterprise across the whole, like that sort of thing. Um, what I would offer is put in your proposals, the, um, the business problem, the impact they're having, the root cause of the problem, and how specifically the features of your product align to addressing each of those root causes, and then have your recommendation and the investment after that. So that way you are um, making sure that everything that you do is really focused on them. And same with like your follow-up, right? Always be kind of coming back to anchoring them in what we're solving for here and telling them what the next step is or what the next yes is within the process. But I don't know, a mutual engagement plan is kind of cheesy to me. I know oh, I'm gonna get, they're gonna come No, no, I, I think it's great. <laughs> like my take is a bit different, uh, but I think everything Rachel said has tremendous value. Typically, what I've found is like if the deal's not worth 50 grand a year in terms of pricing, absolutely not. Do not waste the time trying to build a plan. Uh, if it's more than $50,000, it starts to make sense, but it's totally dependent on what Rachel said. It's all about customer centricity. If they need to organize their process for buying, or if they need an education on what's required to make this decision effectively in their business, then build it for them. But a lot of times, you gotta remember, 70% of the customer's buying is done before you ever talk to them. So they've generally thought a lot about this already, and they probably have some idea in their mind of what this is gonna look like. One of the things that we get confused about, I'm gonna go on a bit of a tangent here, is like, we build sales processes, and we have sales activities, we do all these sales things. None of that crap even matters. At the end of the day, buyers buy. Sales is just to helping people enable their own buying process. How do we get them to do something and stick to it? And so I think to the extent that you're helping an organization or a person navigate it in a way that they visually need to consume that, terrific. Provide value in that way if it makes the experience better. But it's not going to make or break the deal. All it's going to do is enable them to have information they may not already have. And if they already do, you're just duplicating work, which is not a desired experience anyway. Mm -hmm. yeah no i love that that's those are amazing insights those are fantastic and thank you both for that okay we have about 10 minutes left and we have two more things that we want to get through okay so we'll, we'll get through them uh, quickly and make sure everyone's off at the top of the hour here but um just one second here so okay our next talking point that we want to get through we got two more so um i'll start with you rachel um what data do you need to verify opportunity strength or how do you overcome rep bias? So, I mean, I think a lot of the things that we've spoken about, right? So um, the, for me, like this, the opportunity strength is gonna be driven by the size of the gap between where they are today and where they wanna go. And um, if the cost of change is smaller or bigger than the pain of same, right? And so like, that's what I'm looking for when I'm talking about like opportunity strength. Mm -hmm. um, of course, like that you're, that you have multiple um, people, right? We know that there's no one person that's making decisions in an organization. So um, I'm definitely going to look at, you know, are there multiple people involved? One of the things that we do um, uh, as a, from a leadership perspective, when reps are taking a deal through the cycle, we always ask them, what's the next yes? And that is so different than what's the next step, mm. okay? So the next step is a thing like I have another meeting, like the next step is we have a meeting on Tuesday with Bob, right? But when you start to ask the, the um, reps, what's the next yes? They start to fall apart. Meaning if I, if Aaron is my prospect, I, I need, and I'm saying, what's the next yes with Aaron? It's like, what do I need to get him to admit or think before this deal is going to move forward, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe I need Aaron to see and understand that until 
he um, until he uh, enables his sales managers to be better coaches and developers of people, it doesn't matter what else he does, he's not going to hit this revenue target. And I need Aaron to see that, understand that, and admit that his situation is untenable, right? Mm -hmm. And so like to keep driving this opportunity, make it stronger, stronger as a leader and as an able, we're always like, what is the next yes? What do I need this prospect to say? or do or feel or admit um, in order to um, <laughs> in order to get it to get it to move forward. But other than that, it just comes down to when you look in the CRM, like I should be able to look if a deal's gonna close and it's strong, the sales manager or the sales enabled person should be able to go into the CRM and tell you, I can be able to tell everything about the problem, impact, root cause just by the notes that are in there. And if I can't, then I'm like calling crap on you telling me this thing is going to close. Yeah. No, that's great. I like that. I love, I love the point that what's the next. Yes. That's great. Um, Alex, Aaron, do you guys have any, any other additional thoughts to add? I was going to ask Rachel, when you're working with clients, are you helping them tailor like the series of yeses to look for? And then also having like fields on the opportunity associated with those for them to apply notes in order to measure it, measure it and forecast off of it from a leadership perspective? Yeah, absolutely. So like part of like what we do in, in the consulting piece in our business is we make sure that their um, CRM, that even their um, revenue intelligence tools like um, are built out from like a gap selling perspective. And we actually like partner with different, you know, tech tools to help them like align, right? So um, we build, we help build their, sequ like the, the sequences built out in a gap selling perspective. Like our sales force is completely built out, templated of like, here is the business, root cause, impact, physical and literal information, next yes. And, um, and then like when I sit in my pipeline meetings with Keenan, you know, it's always the last question, which is like, what's the next yes, right? And, it, and to me, it's like, yeah, we can automate a lot of these things, but it's also about like training the salespeople to think in this way, right? I know that I cannot show up to a pipeline meeting without that information, or I'm going to get my ass handed to me, right? I have to be able to answer the questions. We open the CRM with our clients and we go, great, what's forecasted? And then we start breaking it down. All right, tell me about this one, right? And we start asking, what's the next yes? And we train the sales frontline sales leaders to do their pipeline meetings in that way and to use the CRM and bring it up within the pipeline meetings and dive into the accounts in that way. So the reps are know what to expect. And so you're driving the behavior and the data at the same time, all completely aligned to your sales process. It's pretty magical I love it. <laughs> when, you, when it's done. <laughs> Amazing. Um, okay. I think we should move on to the last, uh, last topic here. We only have five minutes left and I want to give you guys some time to, to regroup before your next meeting coming up. But um, so Aaron, do you mind if we just jump over this, this slide here? Yeah, skip it. We won't have time for this. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> awesome. Okay. Last one I want to, want to, want to start with here and, uh, Alex, I'll kind of get you to kick it off just uh, to, to, to end this here. But why is executive alignment critical? Um, how can that be automated? Yeah, on that one, I'd say that that one pops up more frequently with enterprise sales, those greater than $50,000 type transactions, or in a smaller organization that you're selling to, maybe it's uh, $25,000 plus where the executives get aligned. But we, we found that that is another indicator of opportunity strength um, that as the seller, uh, if your executive team is engaged with, with the customer's executive team, that helps strengthen the buy-in and the relationship, um, especially you know cultivating a longer-term relationship with the customer. The challenge has always been, um, how do you get record of the fact that that has happened? Um, again, it, it, it often is subject to uh, manual entry at best if it's something that you're asking the reps to record in some fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, again, that's something that drew me to set sale is our capacity to be able to record that at scale 
uh, and still have a lot of privacy controls in place to counteract making sure that none of the other really sensitive communications that an executive is having aren't getting recorded. Um, so that's how we've been helping in both internally and our customers uh, solve for that. Um, so it's exciting to see technologies emerge that are capable of automating that. Um, but regardless of whether you have a tool like that installed or not, uh, certainly for the larger enterprise deals, it's very helpful to um, be able to indicate that that has happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Um, Rachel, Aaron, any additional thoughts to that? I just say one little trick that we've done uh, as we have crafted like opportunity or deal stages, you can make a trigger when you reach a certain stage that like notifies your executive to reach out to a corresponding contact role that's been assigned as like an executive buyer. This is like super technical nerdy stuff, but that's just one way that we found uh, that if the if our senior leader likes to react to tasks, then you can tee it up that way where it's like, oh, moving into this stage now, and then that means they're ready to be notified. And then it just prompts them to send a message out, say, hey, you know, excited we're working together with you all on a potential opportunity. We'd love to talk to you offline, whatever. And we've seen some success with that. Awesome. By the way, executive alignment doesn't always have to happen in mid late stage deal cycles. Um, putting my SDR hat back on, I mentioned I started my career at Cloudera. Lars Nilsson gave me that opportunity, if you know that name. Yeah. And we were really big into account based sales development. We started ghostwriting um, sequences, account-based sales development sequences, uh, CEO to CEO, or you know, C-suite to C-suite, and getting executive alignment right from jump and kicking off the opportunity that way. Uh, so if it's uh, isn't something that you've thought about uh, on your teams out there in the audience, um, it's really really magical when you put those together and and see success with it. It's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Cool. Amazing. Um, okay, guys. Well, we are at time. We have three minutes left, but I'm going to give that back to you to kind of get ready, maybe have a glass of water before your next meeting or whatever it is. But um, Alex, Aaron, and Rachel, um, I can't thank you enough for spending the time with us today, giving us an hour of your day to bless us with this knowledge. I learned so much. I can't wait to kind of see what I can do with this, this information. But um, everybody... If there's any questions or anything that we didn't get to that you uh, have didn't get answered, please go follow Alex, Aaron, and Rachel on, on LinkedIn. You know, shoot them a message, ask them any questions that you might have. I'm sure they'll be more than happy to answer. Um, and again, Set Sail, thank you so much for sponsoring this uh, this event. They're doing some really cool stuff, everybody. So go check them out. Um, but uh, without further ado, I'll let the three of you go. Again, thank you all so much. Um, and uh, and everyone look out for that recording too. So if there's anything you need to resurface on, no need to worry. We'll get that to you within 24 hours. But um, again, thank you all so much. Have the best rest of your day. And I really look forward to doing it again soon. Okay. See you guys. Bye everyone.